Nearly half a century after Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin took their first steps across the moon's Mara Tranquilitatis, or the Sea of Tranquility. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Scientists want to send a robotic explorer to the same lunar region for a deeper dive. An extreme terrain rover concept called Moon Diver to launch in the mid-2020s. If approved by NASA, the rover would descend into one of the enormous pits dotting the surface of the moon. The walls of the cave under consideration for the spelunking spacecraft are about 130 feet deep, followed by another 200 feet of free fall into a deep, dark, mysterious maw beneath the lunar surface. There is a nice poetry to this mission concept, says Laura Kerber, a research scientist at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory and the Moondiver mission concept principal investigator. She says, Apollo 11 landed along the edge of the Sea of Tranquility. 50 years later, we are going to dive down right into the middle of it. Scientists at the 50th Lunar and Planetary Science Conference in Texas this past March 20th presented plans for Moondiver. Moondiver is designed to repel hundreds of feet down into large pits on the moon's surface. During descent, science instruments in the rover's wheel wells would unfold and study the ancient moon by way of its exposed stratigraphy, which is the layers of rock hidden just below the surface. There are over a dozen deep pits known to us on the moon all located in its mare. These are the lava-covered parts of the lunar surface that have cooled into dark basaltic plains. Some of these pits are as wide as a football field and big enough to swallow entire buildings. They formed as voids in the lunar subsurface where their ceilings eventually collapsed, creating large cavernous openings. These cavities expose fresh cuts of rock that are of a particular interest to planetary geologists. In short, these are slices of the moon's rock record that have been largely unaltered for billions of years. The spelunking Moondiver rover could reveal the types, fluxes, and timescales of ancient lava eruptions on the moon. The rover could, in theory, discover what sort of lava flowed, how much erupted, its speed and intensity. By studying the lunar lava, planetary scientists could figure out whether the volcanic activity was robust enough to give the moon a Mars-like atmosphere possibly in the distant past. More information about the moon's eruptions could also help shed some light on the catastrophic effects volcanoes have had on the climate of Mars. Scientists are also extremely interested in the lunar caverns because they could provide shelter for future equipment or even the idea of crude research centers. Below the moon's surface, astronauts would be shielded from radiation, micrometeorites, and the harmful effects of lunar dust and the dramatic temperature swings between lunar night and day. But before anyone could start building a subterranean moon base, scientists need to get a better sense of what lurks below the lunar maria. Moondiver would touch down within a few hundred feet of its target pit and act as an anchor for a simple two-wheeled rover called Axel. Unlike any other rover landed on another world, Axel would not require a ramp to roll off of its lander element. It was designed to repel down things. A tether to the rover would provide it with power and communications as it descends. Axel would carry multiple instrument payloads to survey a lunar cavern, including a stereo pair of cameras for close imaging of the walls and a long distance camera to look across at the opposite side of the pit. A multispectral microscope would detail the mineralogy of the cavern, while an alpha particle X-ray spectrometer would study the elemental chemistry of the rock features. The outer geometry of the target pit in the Sea of Tranquility is shaped like a funnel, and the rover would roll down the staircase-like walls. As terrain grows increasingly rough, Axel could operate the way a human rappeler might descend, swinging and tapping against the walls. Where it touches, the science instruments could deploy and collect data, 
and during the wallless, 200-foot rappel, the rover could take images of its surroundings while dangling helplessly as it is lowered with the tether. Once it reaches the bottom of the pit, Kerber says, Axel would explore the cavern floor, providing humanity's first close look at the subterranean realms of the moon. The rover would carry six times as much tether as it needs, so, however far the bottom of the cavern is, Axel should be able to descend deeply enough to discover what waits below. I have been falling for 30 minutes! Kerber says, the bottom of the pit is total exploration, and we hope to have enough time to just see what the heck is down there. We are thinking a monolith or a big door covered in hieroglyphics, Kerber jokes. Moondiver will be competing for selection as part of NASA's low-cost Discovery Class mission program. If chosen, the mission would begin launch for the moon around 2025. Competing proposals presented at LPSC include a mission to Triton, the largest moon of Neptune, and one to Io, the volcanic satellite of Jupiter. As part of its long-term goal of lunar exploration, NASA plans to construct a lunar outpost in orbit around the moon and to use the station as a stepping stone for crewed missions to the lunar surface. But before astronauts return, a little two-wheeled rover could scout out the deep lunar pits to see if humanity's future on the moon resides in the caverns below, or if something else is already occupying these spaces below the surface. Only time will tell. But NASA claims they aim to find out. According to speculation, some believe this just may be another way of NASA making sure they continue to receive those whopping nine-figure government checks while selling the public grainy images of Earth. Whichever the truth may be, it seems we will all have to wait until 2025 to find out. Regardless of when, the speculation of what they may find is growing. And they had a couple different ideas for what we might find when we go in there. Um, my personal favorite is um, the hollow moon theory. It's this, the theory that the moon is hollow and possibly the entire moon is a spacecraft. And one of these uh, <laughs> holes could be leading down into the center of the moon. Uh, so you might be asking yourself, you know, when I saw this image and everyone else is wondering what's in this cave, are we going to find a monolith? And I'm just calling my friends like, we found rocks, guys, we found so many rocks. Um, so just because we're geologists, or is there something more about this? Why are geologists obsessed with lava layers? Um, so let me go back to a lava story, uh, first with planetary crusts. You've heard this maybe in your geology classes, but um, you, you have different kinds of crusts in the solar system, primary crusts, um, which is sort of f the melting from accretion, you melt the whole planet wide, and then you form the first crust that forms is the pl primary crust, and all of this white part of the moon is primary crust. Then you have the remelting of things in the interior and extrusion of volcanism onto the surface. That makes your secondary crust. So the, the uh, maria of the moon are secondary crust, and then pretty much all of Mars is secondary crust. A lot of the Earth is sort of recycled crust, basaltic crust, and then on the Earth you actually have the tertiary crust, where you keep doing that, melting over and over and over again the crust and getting more and more refined components. So the Moon is a very interesting example because it's a transition from that primary crust to the secondary crust. And it's kind of unusual because when you melted this magma ocean, you had all of the minerals were floating and the, the light minerals floated to the top to make this so-called plagioclase flotation crust. The heavy minerals, olivines and pyroxenes, sank to the bottom. And then you solidified most of the crust and when you did the melting, you were bringing up all of those mafic minerals from the interior and that's what's forming um, these dark maria on the Moon. So on the moon, there's different, there's different ways on different planets of losing heat. Essentially on the moon, you have a stagnant crust and then you have um, lava coming up to the surface and that's how you're losing heat. On Mars, you have this stagnant lid and then you have plumes feeding these uh, long-lived vol volcanic centers and so you're losing heat in that way. Um, it, on Venus, you have a stagnant lid you know, we don't know as much as we want to know about how that works on Venus. It seems to maybe occasionally catastrophically overturn, and you'd have the whole re planet resurface. And you can see this, this image here is just, it's an image of the um, crater density on Venus, and it's pretty much random. So that tells you, okay, there's not parts of Venus that are significantly older than other parts of Venus. And so we kind of think that means it was catastrophically resurfaced about half a billion years ago. And then on Earth you have plate tectonics. So you're constantly recycling the plates, subducting them, more crust is coming up, and that's a way that um, the Earth kind of loses heat with its volcanoes. 
Uh, so I like to think of volcanism as a creator and destroyer of habitable worlds. Um, in its role as a creator, it's a creator of atmosphere. It's a factory creating atmosphere. And so at the very beginning, you'd get a, a primordial atmosphere, and you lose most of that atmosphere into space, hydrogen and helium. Then you start over again, and most of your atmosphere is just composed of outgassing from volcanic gases. In the case of the Earth, you have a tertiary atmosphere. Earth is always living in this tertiary scheme, where you have the actual biology of the planet changing the atmosphere, uh, atmosphere quite dramatically. Uh, so if you take the example of Mars, you know, we always talk about MAVEN. MAVEN is a mission where we're trying to measure how fast the atmosphere is being lost into space, because we say, OK, Mars was nice. Maybe it had some water on it. And then the atmosphere was lost. And a major theory behind that was that uh, Mars used to have a magnetic field like the Earth's. The magnetic field protects the atmosphere from being lost into space. Uh, when Mars lost its magnetic field, it started losing its atmosphere into space. But then there's another half of that equation. You're losing atmosphere, and you're also creating and replenishing atmosphere. And so that at the same time as Mars is losing its volcanic, its uh, magnetic field, its volcanism is also trailing off, too. So you're not only uh, accelerating the loss of the atmosphere, but you're diminishing the replenishment. And then you could say that volcanism is a destroyer of habitable worlds. Because if you didn't have a high enough flux, you'd never get the atmosphere to begin with. But if you have too high of a flux and you have a really strong pulse, you can then take everything that you made and kill it all at once. So here's an example. Um, all of these red bars are huge flood basalt events that have happened in Earth's history. And um, here in gray are all these mass extinction events. And so there's several uh, huge pulses of flood volcanism that are correlated with mass extinction events. And the, mo the most interesting one is this is the Siberian Traps a really large, enormous flood basalt province um, uh, in Russia. And you think about this, we've never seen a kind of eruption like this in the course of human history. These are eruptions that have happened, all of them well before humans ever evolved. And when this one happened, it was the end of the Permian 250 million years ago, and you had the extinction of 96% of all marine species. Um, so I like to say, so here's uh, another example at the end of um, when the dinosaurs were uh, dying. They just changed the name of that transition. I call it KT. Now it's like the K something else. Uh, so the, the dinosaurs, everyone knows that you know, a meteorite hit the earth and it killed the dinosaurs. Well, also at the same time, there was the, the Deccan traps in India. And so people are always arguing back and forth as to what effect these giant eruption had on the death of the dinosaurs versus the impact. Did the impact cause the uh, volcanoes to erupt, et cetera? And so there's several places in Earth history when these two things are correlated. And so I like to say, uh, if you're on a street corner and somebody keeps telling you that the world is going to end in fire and brimstone, um, you should know that it already has. <laughs> and, and it has many times, and it will again. <laughs> you, you don't know when. <laughs> this has been The Confidential Report. For even more stories like this one, make sure to subscribe to our channel today. And please show your support by clicking the like button on this video. For even more stories and news you deserve to know the truth about, follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Thank you for watching The Confidential Report.